My name is Gal. I'm a security researcher. Uh, and in my spare time, I like to sew clothes and play the clarinet. So this presentation is a bit different from what you've seen so far. It's going to be uh, reversing C++ and not developing C++. So the point of view is a bit different. I'm going to solve a mystery or see, show you how I can see a code from assembly. And okay. 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 Um, and also have fun, because it's a bit different uh, talk, and I want to show a different point of view. Okay, so we will start with binary creation. So we all know how it works. You have a code. Okay, the other way, you have a code. It's a, it's a mistake in here. Then you have a compiler, a linker, and then you create a binary. But what if we would like to reverse the process and do the other way? to have a binary and understand the code that was written in the first place. So the solution for that is reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is a process that you take a binary and create a code or understand the logic of the binary that was written. Um, there is some uh, stuff that are different between writing code and reversing code. If when you write you have the names, you have the locals, you have all the all the metadata that will help you. Uh, in reversing, you don't have names, you don't have local variables, you cannot know the names of everything, you need to understand it by the logic of the program. So it makes the job much harder. Also, you have optimi optimizations. Um, when the compiler uh, optimizes your code, it creates a lot of mess in the binary for us as reverse engineers, which uh, kind of make the job a bit uh, harder. There's also uh, two types of reversing. You can do static reversing, which you take the binary and understand what happens there, and you also have dynamic, um, dynamic reversing. When you take the code, run the code, and see what happened in the assembly. Again, we don't have the code itself, just the binary. So we can see, um, we can only see what the um, processor do. Uh, in real time. Okay, so uh, there is one more thing that's important to understand. Reverse engineering is not only for software, you also have hardware reverse engineer, uh, which what it does, it takes a hardware that the person doesn't know what happened there, how the, how the um, board really looks like, and understand how it was built. So we are gonna focus on software uh, reverse engineering. Okay, you might think, what, uh, wh why is it good? What, is, what does it good for? So you can do vulnerability research, which means you look for bugs in code, compiled code, and then exploit them, and, and then exploit them. Uh, you can also understand logic and algorithms of the code in order to do, well, good thing, to um, optimize stuff to understand what you've done better, or you can also take the algorithm and use it as your own uh, in a more like black hat um, approach. Okay, so the reverse engineering process is that you have a binary, then you have a disassembler, which creates the assembly code that the processor run, and then you have a, a, decompi a decompiler and a human that can create a code. There is some options for uh, decompilers that what they do is that they have an assembly code and they can create some kind of a pseudocode that will help reverse engineers uh, reverse the code. Sometimes it doesn't work. For some architectures, it doesn't exist. So you always have to, to a human to work on it and see the code because there is a lot of stuff that aren't uh, reflected properly in the decompiler. And this is me. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, you can choose when you compile a code. So you can choose which architecture do you want to run your code on. ARM, um, Intel, PowerPC, whatever you want. The assembly language, it depends on how it was compiled. I 
I know the language because you can understand it from the code, if it was C, C++, uh, .NET code, um, and I also can see the architecture because there is other uh, um, patterns for uh, ARM and Intel, this is different opcodes. So the disassemblers that you have can um, understand what is the architecture that it was compiled to and then disassemble the code to the relevant architecture. Okay. Okay. So what is the effective way to learn reverse engineering of CPP code? Obviously, play Chicken Invader. <laughs> and win Chicken Invader. But there is a problem. I'm not good at this game <laughs> at all. But the only thing I can do is cheat and make a way to make this game a bit easier and in a way that I could win this. Okay, so this is our objective. We want to win the game. So we need to patch the binary and understand the logic in order to make the game easier so it will be we will be able to win let's start okay so what do we want we want to uh, win the game in general but specifically what we want is to make the chicken boss um, easier to win that it will have uh, other um, members and stuff that will make it easier what else do we have we also have the spaceship that we might want to and change and make it stronger. And we also want to learn reverse engineering of C++ binaries. This is the main goal, actually. <laughs> okay, what do we have? We have the binary of the game. We have a, a tool for disassembling the code. We have the knowledge we have in C++, and we maybe have some knowledge in reverse engineering that we want to use. So let's start with the tools that we have for reverse engineers to uh, understand the code. We have uh, so some options for disassemblers. We have uh, Radar, Gaidra, Binary Ninja, and also IDA Pro. Uh, in this case, they are all different in how much they cost, the options that they provide. In our case, we are going to use an uh, IDA tool. Um, Ida Pro is my favorite uh, disassembler, and this is what we're going to use in our talk today. Okay, so there is a few things we need to um, understand before we start the reversing process. Uh, the first is that there is some important registers. As you know, um, when you have an assembly, the memory is stored in registers, also can be stored on stack, heap stuff, but we are going to talk about the registers specifically in here. Um, there is some important ones, RX or EDX, which is the 64 or 62 um, size register, is usually the uh, return address, the return of a function is stored in EAX or RX. Uh, RCX and ECX, it's also an important register for us because it stores the object pointer. And um, one more point that maybe I didn't mention but is written there, it's, it's only for MSVC um, compiler. In that I'm, we are going to focus on uh, MSVC, and this is, ex this is why I uh, mention it, because it's different in different compilers. Um, one more thing is that the functions, arguments, are passed in registers in fast call 64-bit uh, MSVC. Um, what means that you can see the register, you have RCX, RDX, then RDI, RSI, R8, R9, and then all the other arguments are passed on the stack. Um, that's in general. Okay, so C++ concept in 60 seconds. We have a code here, just a simple code, doesn't do anything really important, but the important part is down there. You can see there is a creation of an object. The object, um, we are going to show the code and the assembly line that um, compiled from it. You have the new. You can see a call for operator new. I hope it's not too uh, low in the screen. But you have a call for operator new. Uh, that, uh, and also you have a further one a constructor, that you have a constructor call in the right side. Okay. So we are going to talk about a, um, basic constructors. How can you recognize a constructor from the code? 
So the first thing that you want to see in a constructor is the vtable assignment to the object. The vtable is assigned for the four or eight bytes of the object, the first four or eight bytes. Um, it depends on the um, 86 or 64 uh, binary. Also, you have um, the members of the object, which is um, just after the vtable pointer, you also have all the members, pointers, or values uh, in the object itself. Uh, in case you have an inheritance, you will also see a call for the uh, constructor of the father. Um, and the last thing is, you can see the example here. You have, I'll use this. Okay, you have here the vtable that is assigned to uh, EAX in this case. EAX this example of code is 32 bit, which means that the, okay, I can't see it here, but anyway, in this case, everything is pushed onto the stack instead of what I showed before. Um, so you have the vtable, it's assigned to the first, uh, to the first byte in EAX. You have offset zero, so it cannot be seen here. Then you have object member, which is stored in XMM zero register and stored in um, EAX plus eight, which means it's stored in the, um, as the second member, you have the vtable, and after the eight bytes of the pointer, you have uh, the object. Okay, yes. It's something the IDA Pro uh, can show you that it's a vtable. In this case, uh, in this case, I uh, compiled the code here with symbols, so you can see it say con const or count, and then vtable because the object called account. But usually, you just see like vtable with no name, so you cannot know which vtable is relevant for which object. Okay, so in a few seconds, I'll show you how a vtable looks like, but it's actually a, an a lot of pointers right after um, one, like one after uh, another. And IDA can recognize a vtable because afterwards in the code itself, there is also calls for the pointers inside this vtable. But the process that IDA does is quite uh, complicated. It's a program that has been developed for a f lot of years. So um, I don't, I cannot say exactly how, but I guess that this is how it realized that this is a vtable. Um, okay, so what I said before, just forgot that I marked it on the, on the presentation. Before we have the vtable assignment and here we have the object members. Okay, virtual calls. Virtual calls is a main thing as uh, reverse engineers for C++, because as you can see here, this is the virtual call itself. We have a register and a call for a register. I cannot know the address. I cannot know what it calls, just that it's a virtual call and that's being um, done in here. Here you can see that the virtual function is being moved to EAX, that afterward is being called in here. And before you have the for the vtable to EDX. So the EAX has the function itself in the virtual table and the virtual table pointer is assigned to EDX before. And this is everything uh, just together. Okay, after we did the small, uh, yes. Yes, yes, As a, no, no, it's the for as byte, which means it's the second function in this 32-bit code. It's the second function. You have one in offset zero, one in offset four, and then if you have more, it's in offset eight. And the second function. Yes, exactly. If it wasn't clear, so it's good that you asked. Okay, the game itself. After we did uh, the small uh, summary of the basics, we are gonna continue to the game. So we have the chicken invader, but we want to understand how to begin. Like, how do would I know how to win the game? So the basic thing that uh, you can do is look at the strings. The binary compiled with strings that you can look at, and then I found this one. You won the game, your final score. Seems like what we wanted. 
So this function, this uh, string was called from controller run level. Okay, I can go to this function and look what we have there. I looked at the function itself and I saw that the first thing that it does is that it um, creates a shared pointer of type uh, space, spaceship. And I wanted to look further at this object to understand what happens there. Okay, so the constructor. We already talked about how uh, you can find a constructor. And now we are going to talk about what we can do with the constructor. So the first thing we have is the game object. You have a call for something called game object constructor, which is a bit weird. But if you remember from what I said before, when you have a call for a constructor of different object, it's the in, in the constructor. It's the, it means that the object inherits from, a, from game object. The second thing we have is that we have the V table of spaceship assigned to the first eight bytes of R6. And as I mentioned before, R6 is usually the uh, register that stores the pointer to the object. Okay, this is a spaceship uh, V table. As you can see, I'm not sure if the color is quite okay, but as you can see here, the V table is constructed, is made of game object functions, but also one spaceship function, which called move obj. Okay, so what it means is that this object inherits from game object, as we said before, but there is some virtual function that was created in the father that was changed here in spaceship. But we need to understand how it was looked like from the father side. Okay, the game object constructor. You can see a simple, oops. You can see a simple assignment of the V table of game object to the first eight bytes of RSCX. And also, we want to understand the members better since it inherits from each other. So we want to understand how the game object, the father, looks like to understand the spaceship itself. So we have two calls for uh, functions. We can see the value that EAX or REX in the EAX in this case is uh, moved into RCX in offsets uh, eight, 8 and 12 which means the second member is divided to two, four, um, two parts of four bytes each. And this is the return values from the function's calls. Okay. The game object has a lot of functions in its vtable, as you can see here and here. But what is the most interesting here is the pure call. This is what I said before. We saw that the spaceship had one function that was uh, different in the V table. There was lots of game object function, which is the father's functions, and also one that was move object, that was a spaceship one. So this is the reason we have a pure call that you can see also in the assembly, and that was changed afterwards in the um, sun. So until now we only uh, saw assembly, and now I'm going to show like what we understood so far from the assembly in a code. Okay, um, so everything I said before, we only looked at assembly code, no code at all, just binary, and we could understand the functions from the game object, we can understand there was virtual functions, we can understand some of the members that we reversed before with the function calls, and actually it is possible to understand from a binary how a code looks like quite, um, quite in details. This is also the spaceship, it's quite um, a partial because we only reverse some part. We can see it inherits from game object. We can see there is some uh, virtual code that it implements. Okay, so after we understand those objects, um, we wanna go back and understand the flow of the code. The run level. Run level is the function that I said before that called the string um, won the game, if you remember. And now we want to understand what happens there. So after the spaceship shared pointer, uh, we also have these uh, li two lines of assembly. We ha was some in the middle, but this is the important ones. You can see that there is a field wave vector function that is being called. So what you can see if you go inside this function is that there is a lot of call 
for the, there were lots of creation of unique pointers of type wave interface. Okay. And there is also uh, some and then the vector in place back all the objects that uh, you have, which is for example in here wave two. Um, okay. We also, after some reading in the code, we can see that there is some kind of a wave boss too, and unique pointer that was added to the vector, which kind of make us a uh, wonder because the name is the similar to the bosses that we wanted before. The waves are actually when all the chickens come to the game and start to shooting eggs on you. So this is called a wave. Okay. So after reversing the code, this is the code what we've seen. There is some kind of a vector that employs back uh, objects of type waves. Um, and now we want to understand how it uses this wave object. Okay. The beginning we can see there is a counter that is initialized with zero. And afterwards you have the fill vector uh, function. So what happens inside? I'll explain it a bit. Um, so the first thing we see that it counter in order to um, use the vector um, the, the vector um, object inside the object inside the unique oh, sorry the unique pointers inside the vector and then uh, what it does that here uh, it's put it in a p wave which p wave is a local variable that's stored on the stack. Okay, what happened afterward? So afterward, you have the run level virtual call. What do you mean? We talked about virtual calls before. The virtual calls are quite uh, different because you have a call to a register that we don't know what is its value. We don't have an address, we only have a register. So what we can see here is that um, if we reverse all of this code and understand each time what happens statically, it will take a very long time. It will be very frustrating understanding what was called, which object it was, and also understand which function from the V table it called. So we are going to start a uh, dynamic reversing. Everything we did so far is a static reversing. We took the binary, we looked at it, we didn't run the code except for playing the game, and we just looked at the binary itself to understand patterns, to understand assembly, to understand how it works like. So the second part will show you the dynamic part, but first we have a small recap so you would understand what happened. So this is the code we understood from reversing uh, the assembly. What we can see here is they have uh, two functions in controller that we saw. One is run level that has a call that calls a function that creates a vector with unique pointers of waves, both wave one, wave two, which we still don't know what they do, and also wave boss one, two, three, and, and so on. And also we can see that it goes over all the unique pointers inside the vector and uses them and calls some function inside them. Okay, so in order to make this process a bit uh, faster and do not uh, do everything statically, we uh, run the code dynamically now. So we placed a breakpoint on the virtual call itself. Yeah. And we want to see what happens, how the registers look like, what is the function that's being called, which objects are in use, and this is how we are going to continue from now. So here you can see there is the code that is being run. And here you have all the uh, registers values. I can show you in here there is Rx. I enlarged it a little, and you can see the value here is, seems like a pointer. If we go to this address, we can see it's, um, it's a, a pointer to a function in a virtual call, in a virtual table, sorry. <laughs> and the virtual table, the virtual function is create wave in wave three. I did it a few times. I played the game and stopped it while I played. And then I could see that it was calling this create uh, wave function. Okay, so we do it again because we want to check that it's consistent and which function is being called virtually. And again, we can see that Rx stores a pointer to an address, which this address is wave4 create uh, wave, which is the virtual function 
um, that's being called now. Okay, so we can understand from this process that the virtual cause is actually for create wave. And the function that's being called is the create wave in each wave um, unique pointer that we already saw before. That the counter initializing um, with zero and then continue and go through the vector with all the pointers to the object, then take the object and use the create uh, wave function. Okay, but what more that we've seen, the second thing that we've seen that in this function, in the, I don't know which number, but after some iterations of this uh, virtual call, the function that was called was create wave for wave boss. And if you remember, wave boss seems a bit suspicious because we want to change the boss and make it easier for us. So examine wave boss too. We still have a, we, we are gonna repeat a bit of the process that we've done so far that you're supposed to be now an expert who is analyzing constructors. Um, the wave boss uh, uses um, the V table of uh, chicken boss two. And also, uh, the, okay, it uses a, a V table of chicken, point, chicken boss two, which is different from wave boss and also calls uh, which I, you cannot see here, but it also calls the constructor of chicken boss. The second thing that we have here, we have a weird number as a member um, that we still don't know, but remember it, it will come back in a few slides. Okay, so the flow from here. I don't wanna repeat the same um, process again, so I'll just do it, um, I'll just explain what was done and then you could understand the flow that was, was, that was da being done in order to understand the, to understand the boss. So, uh, we already understood that wave boss inherits from chicken boss too. And, and our step, next step is to understand chicken boss too and to see what we can understand about the object in order to uh, analyze it and to improve, um, improve this game for us. Okay, so this is a summary of everything that was uh, found. Um, this is what I said. It's quite similar to what we've done so far, so I'm gonna just go through it and say what, what was done. Um, after reversing chicken boss two, we understood that there is some kind of a chain of inheritance here. Um, there is wave boss two, who inherits from a chicken boss two. Chicken boss 2 inherits from chicken base, and chicken base inherits from game object that we already analyzed before. This is why I said it's gonna be a quite a long process that it took, but I'm gonna go through it uh, quite fast. Okay, we also uh, looked at the game object again and see who inherits from game object. And we realized there is more than one object that inherits from it. There is also chicken base that we talked about, regular chickens also inherit from game object, spaceship. It means it's a general object of the game. Um, so, also, after reversing the constructor, we could find that one of the members is the number of lives that the object has, which means it's quite good for our cause. Now we know what to change. Um, so if you remember this uh, weird number, this one, this offset, which is uh, 18 a hex, is the offset of the member of the number of life. So now, we need to look at the hex of this um, binary. We have here the, the amount of life, which is 15. It's quite hard to hit this boss 15 times since it's moved and just shoot eggs everywhere, so we need to make it easier. I guess that one is good enough for us. Um, this is the assembly code, the hex, the hex representation of this opcode. And you see here the first three bytes representing this part, the move, the word PTR, RX plus uh, 18 hex. And the second part, the uh, 0F00000, is the 50 number. So if we will change this hex to one, okay, we can see that also the assembly code changed and now we only have one life uh, for the boss. 
Okay. So this is um, this is how you can change the game and play it. And now we have one life. We can shoot the the boss and everything successful. So this is in general. I guess it was uh, a bit quicker than I thought, but. Um, I'm going to conclude everything we said so far. Um, reverse engineering is C++ is fun for me. <laughs> Most of the people say it's quite frustrating. And in this case, we actually saw everything with symbols. So it's quite different when you don't have names, you don't have local variables, you don't have anything. You just need to understand everything on your own. So in this case, I tried to make it a bit easier so everyone could understand and enjoy it. But usually what you have is that you don't have anything. All the functions uh, has like random numbers as names. And this you need to understand everything. Uh, so what we usually do is that we need to create a lot of automation for reversing C++ process. Um, OK. We also need to do a lot of automation for this process in order to uh, be able to reverse the code without, well, how do you say it, being depressed. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is in general. Oops, this is the wrong. OK, so that's it. In a wrap up uh, of reverse engineering C++ and the process of how it really works like, um, does anyone have any questions or anything? Yes. So the binary had symbols when I downloaded it. It sometimes happened that people just compile in debug mode, and <laughs> and then that's what happens. <laughs> like <laughs> if you compile and release, everything is just disappeared. But when you compile and debug, so a lot of the naming is inside the binary. It makes the reverse engineers work much easier. If you look for vulnerabilities, for example, it's really nice for us. I'm not sure if you would like that to happen, but uh, if you compiled in a debug, this is what happens. Yes. What? I don't use deep learning to find those. I know that there was, I talked with someone who said that there was a project about it, um, but it's quite hard to understand all of those things because also C++ is changing all the time, and I specifically don't do deep learning, so I can't really give you a concrete answer about yes or no, but for now there is no public solution uh, for the problem in with deep learning. Yes. <laughs> okay, it's kind of funny, because while I uh, reversed everything, you can see that there is uh, standard libraries, and I kind of go inside the standard libraries code, but in assembly. <laughs> and so it was uh, quite frustrating, but still really interesting for me. So you can see those things. Also, uh, sometimes you don't, if you don't have the names, there is options to understand that the same code and diff the code with the standard library, understand the function is a standard library. What? Yes, like functions like this, you can see the names usually because IDA parsed it. Um, there is now in the new IDA a server that contains a lot of symbols for functions. So when you download all the symbols that they have, uh, the standard library exists with their name. But if you don't have it, you can diff uh, the code with standard libraries and see. Um, sometimes in embedded, it's quite common that you have it, that you don't have the standard libraries and you need to understand what is printf, what is all mem copy, for example, and, and then you have a much um, longer process for reversing. Yes. A comment for what? So there is a lot of um, um, references for uh, reversing tutorials um, that I can give you specifically or publish if you would like. But for reverse engineering of C++, it's not very common that someone is uh, specifically target C++ as a language for reversing. So there isn't like a cookbook that you can say, okay, do those steps and other steps. It also comes with experience to understand which parts are the important ones. Because you usually have megabytes of code in the good 
like case, and then you cannot go through everything in the assembly. And you need to focus. So the experience is what gives you the knowledge of go there or there by like how you feel about the flow. Yes. So the first thing <laughs> is like don't compile in debug mode. <laughs> it, it's quite like the the it's quite common that people. One second. <laughs> it's quite common that people compile and debug it. It makes my life much easier. The second thing is that, um, well, it's C++, it has lots of uh, stuff that make the language more secure. And um, when you have like smart pointers and stuff like that, that uh, vulnerabilities in the code are, can be avoided with it. You always have vulnerabilities everywhere, so you cannot avoid everything. Everyone makes mistakes, so it's a thing that happened, but I guess that you need to know what you do. It's not necessarily I can give you one answer, but you need to know how to write code properly, so I would not have the easy stuff to, to exploit and find. Yes, sorry. You mean you mean you compile um, the? Mm -hmm. See everything. So we, yeah, it happens sometimes that is it. At the end, people just talk about it, and then people take it out, like disappear all of those things that they do wrong. It's true. <laughs> also, Twitter is a good place to catch up with um, reverse engineering things and new blogs, and uh, so it's quite a useful thing if you want to go into this field. So I agree. Uh, and I have a question actually. Mm -hmm. I don't usually uh, reverse games. I usually uh, reverse embedded systems. You can also ha do some CTFs and start with the beginners and then learn reversing or exploit or vulnerabilities if this is the field that you're interested in. So there is resources that you can have. If someone wants uh, help or links or anything, just send me a message and I will be happily uh, give you the links for what you need. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, quite funny that you uh, say it because it's different. When you have a bytecode, it's much easier. You can see the code uh, with some. If I have the binary itself, so it's a binary, so it's the same. They cannot go. Okay, when you have a bytecode, you can tra uh, transform from the bytecode to some to a code. Actually, when you have a Java, C sharp, and languages like this, but when you have the binary, so you need to reverse it like everything else. Mm -hmm. So you, if you have the binary, so IDA uh, is a very good option. If you want something free, so you can use a Kydra or something else. If it can understand it was C sharp before. So yes, there is some uh, signatures that IDA runs on the code that can uh, sh that shows you what was 
the, the, the language that it was compiled from. It's not 100%, it's what they think with patterns and some stuff that they see in the compile. Uh, with the, after the compiler uh, did some stuff. I'm not familiar with exactly how the signatures are um, written, but there is signatures that either runs on the code to understand what language it was before. It's called flirt and stuff like this. Okay, yes. So C++ is quite difficult because of the virtual call, the inheritance. It has more um, concepts that are hard to reverse than C. So when you have C, you have the flow, you have a call for, f you don't have virtual calls, which is quite the most um, frustrated thing in C++. Also, the objects that you have in C++ also make a lot of overhead for the reverser. The time that even to start reversing the logic itself, you have all the uh, inheritance to build the inheritance, to understand the object, to understand virtual call. So the difference is usually that C++ takes much longer to reverse because you have a lot of stuff that you need in the metadata of in the metadata of uh, the code itself before you start diving into the logic because you cannot see almost you can see almost nothing when you just go without understanding anything about uh, the object, the inheritance, the virtual calls. Um, so this is the main difference. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So you want like examples for tools that you have. So I wrote one named Virtualer, which it hooks all the virtual calls, and then automatically when you run the code, it creates all the structures of the virtual tables and also connects it with, uh, with, with the assembly. So why I have done this is that I had two machines that talk with each other, and if you stop and look at every virtual call, it just, they keep, they, they send like keep alive and they didn't receive it, they shut down and you need to start from the beginning. So I need something that will run automatically. I don't need to stop every time and will build, uh, build everything um, quite easily for me as a reverser to look at, but also quite uh, fast. So I hook all the virtual calls, I built the virtual tables in IDA and also uh, connected it to the assembly so you could see which uh, virtual call called which functions. Um, yeah, there is also some scripts and code that creates object, but um, it's not always uh, quite accurate. So you always need to go through it and check. Um, this is generally. Is there any questions? Any more? Thank you.